All right. <clears throat> Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Motown Sports Talk Podcast. I'm your host, Jordan, and of course, I'm always joined by my co-host, Jimmy. How are you doing today? Doing great. Thanks. Awesome. Um, so, yeah, we got a few things to talk about today. The first thing I wanted to talk about was my recent article that I wrote last week for the Sideline Report. I discussed if that on Johnson and DeAndre Swift could possibly break the record set by Reggie Bush and Joyke Bell back in 2013. And that was the first ever NFL duo to NFL teammates to set an NFL record for both having 500 receiving and 500 rushing in the same season. And again, I wrote that is still a feature that is yet to be done again. There's only one team that's even came close, and that was the New Orleans Saints with Mark Ingram and Alvin Kamara, where Mark Ingram was only 81 rushing yards or 81 receiving yards away from breaking or setting the same record back in 2017. So it's again, it's not easy to do. It's not like people are just doing it every year in the NFL. So and again, I kind of gave my thoughts on what's going to happen, but I guess I wanted to get your thoughts. What do you what do you think about that? Yeah, well, first of all, I love the article. And the reason is because we've suffered a lot as Lions fans, but it's Mm -hmm. really nice to be reminded of some amazing things that have happened in the past. And this is one thing that if you look at the stats and the likelihood of this happening, it's really an amazing thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, back in 2013 when this happened, there were a couple factors that helped allow it to happen. One was Burleson reaching for a pizza and breaking his arm. (laughs) And he yeah. was out for eight games that year. So our number one receiver was Calvin, of course. He had 1,492 yards. Our mm-hmm. number two wide receiver that year, Chris Durham, the 490. Burleson only had 461. Then he had Pettigrew, 416. Fourier, 207. I don't know if you remember that guy. Yep, Joe Fourier. Uh, then Ryan Broyles at 85 <laughs> yards. And Theo Riddick, only 26 yards that year. He ended up being a monster for us in the future. Right. And... So that helped allow Bell and Bush to get those 500 receiving yards, which is the more difficult aspect of the 500-500 combination there, the receiving yards versus the rushing yards. Mm -hmm. And the commonality of all those things is Stafford, who's just really good at throwing to running backs. He's just Mm -hmm. really good at distributing the ball. So... In 2013, how many other running backs had 500 yards receiving? Only 10. Jamal Charles, Danny Woodhead, Darren Sproles, Matt Forte, Noshan Marino, LaShawn McCoy, Giovanni (laughs) Bernard, Pierre Thomas, and then Reggie Bush was last with 506 yards. So he snuck in there. Mm -hmm. Sort of like a blast from the past listening (laughs) to some of those names. Yeah. I was just going to say, I forgot forgot, like half those names on there. (laughs) Yeah. So now let's look at uh, the past couple years. How many running backs have had 500 receiving yards? In 2018, only eight. McCaffrey leading the way. Mm -hmm. In 2019, only seven. Again, McCaffrey leading the way. You start seeing why McCaffrey got paid so much. He's (laughs) he's just a monster as a receiver. Mm -hmm. So very, very few running backs actually hit that 500 receiving mark. So for two of them from the same team to get it, is almost inconceivable. So it is really amazing what Joyke Bell and Reggie Bush were able to do in 2013. Yeah, exactly. Uh, as far as go- this year, what are the chances of that? It's possible. Uh, you got a couple obstacles there. Bo Scarborough is going to be an obstacle because he was pretty good last year as mm-hmm. a pounding running back. If he gets a bunch of touches, a bunch of playing time, that's going to affect uh, DeAndre Swift and carry on johnson's uh playing time there so that's Mm -hmm. one issue and if everybody stays healthy that's going to be another obstacle exactly that's the biggest thing um is like you mentioned earlier because that's the kind of reason they were able to attain that record is because of injuries and we only had one decent wide receiver who's being triple covered every play so who else do you have to throw it to when you got two talented backs out of the or two talented running backs out of your backfield so yeah, so, and again, like you said, if our team could stay healthy, there is a plethora of talent on this team when it comes to all of our, again, we mentioned last week our depth at wide receivers, how who's going to make the team. We have a talented running back group, the tight end group. If they could stay healthy, it should be phenomenal as well. So yeah, that's going to be. Yeah, will probably have a lot of yards <laughs> this year. Yeah, we've been seeing videos of him working out lately and getting pretty big with George Kittle. So, yeah, like I said, there 
if everyone can stay healthy, our offense is too dangerous for them to, for us to rely on just to those two guys the entire time. So the likelihood of that happening is very unlikely. But again, as I mentioned in the article, if you kind of look around the league, and as you just mentioned it, it's if you look at the uh, duo that could possibly do it, there's not too many others in the league that, even like you said with Christian McCaffrey down in Carolina, I can't even think of their backup running back off the top of my head besides right. McCaffrey. So. Yeah, it's like there's some good running backs that could obviously attain like a thousand rushing a 500 receiving, but to have the duo that could both do that on the same team, it's it's almost I wouldn't say impossible, but it's very very unlikely. Yeah, but we have a chance. I agree with you. So it'll be fun to watch this year. Yeah, it's going to be exciting either way. Like I said, so um, we'll move on to our next topic, and that's again a little bit breaking news this week. And I can't believe it's taken this long, but Cam Newton has finally been signed and that team being the New England Patriots, which honestly is not very shocking. When I got it, I was initially shocked, but then I thought, I'm like, it's kinda kinda what I expected, especially when you see that they haven't drafted a quarterback. That was also shocking as well. And what's his name? Jared Stidham, I believe, is their current quarterback. Um, Yeah, Stidham. Yep, I believe, yeah, I believe that's their current quarterback. And (laughs) all he's played is ever preseason snaps, so. It's going to be very interesting, and I know you had some comments about his injury history and kind of how that relates to the Lions. Yeah, so why has Cam Newton not been signed until now? Well, I think it's injuries, and mm-hmm. teams know about the injuries, which is why they're just afraid to touch him. Uh, he only signed for about $7.5 million for one year as mm-hmm. a maximum possible deal with the New England Patriots. That's the most he could make with all the bonuses and uh, options he could get. Yeah. So he's had shoulder injuries in the past, and the main thing I want to talk about is the foot injury he had last year. He had a Liz Frank injury in 2019, surgery on it in December of last year. So that's only a few months ago. Mm-hmm. Now, let's talk about what the Liz Frank injury is. It was named for Jacques Liz Frank, who died in 1847. He was a field surgeon in Napoleon's army. He noted that. Uh, horseback riders, the soldiers, would sometimes get their foot caught in a stirrup when they're getting on or off and twist their foot. Mm-hmm. And it would injure the midfoot part of the foot. That's about where the ankle starts going down towards the toe area. Mm-hmm. Now, there's a joint there that comprises many bones and ligaments of the foot. And the foot is a very complex part of the body with a whole lot of bones, ligaments, and things holding things together. So it's easy for things to go wrong. Mm -hmm. So there can be varying levels of types of injury in that Liz Frank joint. So just saying somebody has a Liz Frank injury doesn't tell you the severity, doesn't really tell you a whole lot, just tells you where the injury is. Yeah. So some can just be a simple sprain of the ligaments, some can be worse, some can have fractures, avulsion fractures or other fractures. They can have cartilage damage as well, Mm -hmm. uh, which is the cartilage that covers the bone, which allows the joint to move smoothly and without pain. Mm -hmm. So if they have cartilage damage, that can lead to chronic pain and arthritis. So that's what the Liz Frank injury is. Uh, and when I hear somebody has a Liz Frank injury, that's not a good injury. Uh, for running backs, it's bad news. So let's talk about, as Lions fans, uh, how this has played in part of our history. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you remember 2004 draft with Kevin Jones, who was drafted in the first round, mm-hmm. same year as Roy Williams. We were thinking that was just a monster draft for us. We had our number one wide receiver, number one running back. I love Kevin Jones coming out of college. He was this really shifty running back. Mm -hmm. Just looked great. Well, for some reason, when he entered the pros, he gained a bunch of weight. And he wasn't as shifty anymore. So he was becoming more of a pounding running back. Well, I still remember this goal line play where he tried to just jam it right up the middle and just got crushed. And that's when he injured his foot. In, and had a Liz Frank injury in 2006. Mm. And he only played another couple years after that. He only played total of five years in the NFL. So that injury really derailed his career. A more recent example, Amir Abdullah. He had a Liz Frank injury in 2016, his second year. Uh, I don't know if you remember the plays against the Colts. He made some awesome moves. It was like one of his best rungs. And he tried to make this move at the end. It was a non-contact injury, which is how a lot of these Liz Frank injuries occur. Mm-hmm. He just sort of twisted his foot. He's just so powerful and such a quick runner that he just put all, 
too much pressure and twisting on his foot and injured his list frank yeah. and we've seen what happened to his career after that which is yeah. it, he is just never the same exactly. and not really productive other guys who's who've had list frank injuries in the nfl are Taysom hill Le'Veon bell ben roethlisberger so it's a pretty common injury yeah now generally for quarterbacks it's slightly less concerning because their game isn't as based on quick movements and running however for a guy like cam newton where he has elite running skills and a large part of his success in his game what made him an mvp was his ability to just escape and break off huge runs as well as uh gain these short yardage plays these fourth down plays goal line plays where he's just unstoppable this guy's mm. a beast so for a mobile elite running quarterback like Cam Newton, it is a larger concern. And even if he doesn't run, it can affect your ability to throw the ball, just planting your foot. Yeah. So I think there are major concerns uh, with the list Frank injury with Cam Newton, which is why no one's been interested in touching him. Yeah, that makes complete sense. And I'm glad you went into more detail and kind of explaining it. Because again, like you said, when they just kind of list an injury, we don't always exactly know. We just think, oh, it's ankle and blah, blah, blah. And that's another thing, too. And again, I've spoke on this before, but like back and knee and ankle and problems like that, they don't tend to ever go away. Even with surgery and stuff like that, there's still always that like you said, minor pain or arthritis or developing pain over time that's going to continue to continue to worsen. So it, those aren't easy injuries to manage. So some people also kind of claimed, especially with New England, that it might have been his personality that kind of kept him from being signed with being, you know, being such a strong vocal person in the locker room that would Bill Belichick want to bring in someone like that. But again, I'm not sure it had much to do with that. I think it was more injury related. Yeah, he, he is a quirky personality. He's a little bit more outgoing, a little bit different in some ways than other quarterbacks. Uh, he was featured on the All or Nothing on Amazon a couple years ago mm -hmm. with the Carolina Panthers, and he's a very interesting guy, and I actually liked him more after watching the show than before. I, I found him to be very engaging. I found him to really care about his teammates, and I actually yeah. really thought he was a good character. So. Uh, it's hard to say if a uh, character is part of it, but it could be. Yeah. Like I said, obviously, when you look at teams like the Lions, who Matt Patricia pushed out all the vocal players in the locker room, so it wouldn't really make sense for like a team like the Lions to bring in Cam Newton. I know I don't ever think they were even thinking about it, but again, if you were looking at bringing someone like that in, I don't think that's the type of player that Patricia or Bob Quinn would want in their locker room. So it's different around the league but again i think just regardless in terms of him being signed to any team out of all 32 i think it was more injury related than again personality related so yeah i guess we'll move on from that and the next topic we want to talk about is we touched on it a little bit last week but we know that after martha ford has stepped down that her daughter sheila hamp is taking over and she did a introductory press conference earlier in the week and the, my biggest takeaway from this is that even though her mom has been in charge over the last few years, she has still been very, very much involved in all of the league meetings. She's gotten to know some of the other owners and other, again, league leaders around the league and stuff. So that's my biggest takeaway, I guess. Again, she had a few other tidbits, but I guess what were your kind of thoughts or takeaways from her press conference, Jimmy? Yeah, I agree with you. She made it pretty clear that she has been very involved in the past few years. And... Mm -hmm. Her quote was, this was a long plan transition, or maybe Rod Wood made that quote. It was a long plan transition, yeah. which suggests that there's no immediate changes in store. She's mm -hmm. already been involved in a lot of the decision making. Yep. And she says it was, quote, definitely a joint decision to retain Quinn and Patricia from last year. So she was involved in that decision as well. Mm -hmm. One of my big takeaways is she seems very energetic, excited, really enthusiastic about being the owner. It's really n nice to see. You can hear it yeah. in her voice. She's, she's just sort of happy and excited about it. Uh, she She's just getting her feet wet over the past few years, so she has some experience, and it sounds like she really feels like she needs to learn a little bit more. Uh, she, she mentioned that she wants to get to know the analytics team more. I was excited that she mentioned analytics because I, I love analytics, and I wish right. teams would use that a lot more than they do. But she didn't really go further and state that she really 
is actually interested in making that a bigger part of the team, though. I, I wish she would have said that. Right. So my big takeaway is that it was nice to hear from her because I don't even remember hearing Martha Ford. I don't even know if she had a press conference back a few years ago. Uh, so it was nice hearing Sheila Hamp and the energy she brought to things. Yeah, I completely agree. And yeah, like you said, just the very enthusiasm she brings and she seems like she's very motivated to work with the team. And that's another thing that she said in her interview is that she's going to be very hands on with the team and be very personal. And like you even said, she wants to get to know, she already obviously knows like not Patricia Bob Quinn, but she said she wants to get to know the rest of the team and like the analytics and all the the day in day out workings of the team and she wants to personally get to know a lot of them and how the team works from the inside out so I, that's something i again thought was very interesting as well and anybody who's worried about her selling it you don't need to worry about it she clearly is all in she when she was talking to the media she knew everybody's name she was yep. saying hi like they were good buddies so she's she's a very nice person and she's very committed to mm -hmm. the team in this area so uh we're getting a good owner for the long run here Exactly. And as we mentioned before, and she mentioned in her press conference, she grew up in Detroit and she's been a Lions fan going to games her entire life. So I don't ever see her selling the team or moving on or something like that. So, so, but again, as far as the way or structure of the team or anything like that, I, I really, like you said, I don't think anything's going to change. It's been, this has been a planned transition for a while now. And yeah, so. Yeah, she did. The big question out of the press conference was, what is the status of Patricia and Quinn at the end of this year? How good do they need to be? That's sort of the big question on everybody's mind after that statement last year. Yeah. And I really get the sense that she likes Patricia and Quinn, and mm -hmm. she was part of the decision-making bring those guys on, and she doesn't want to get rid of them. She had mentioned that one of the reasons other teams have success is because of consistency. Now, whether that's a chicken egg situation, winning creates consistency or consistency creates wins, mm -hmm. hard to say, but she likes consistency. And I think she wants Patricia and Quinn to stay, even if they don't necessarily have that good of a year. So uh, that's the sense I get out of her press conference. Yeah, I've discussed this before. I, c I can't remember if it was on here or if it was, um on Twitter with somebody, but yes, I've discussed this many times and I believe, I kind of firmly believe, but even before this transition happened, that no matter what, unless we went 0-16 or 1-15, I really think that no matter what, even if we don't make the playoffs that Bob Quinn and Matt Patricia will be back, as long as we show some type of improvement, and again, if we get to six, seven wins, I really see them coming back no matter what, unless it's just a complete you know, blowout year, which I don't see that happening. Yeah, unless there's a mutiny of the players <laughs> or something. It's crazy like that. I agree. I I think it'll be pre pretty easy if, for us to improve from 3, 12, and 1. And you throw in the extra playoff team this year, as well as the whole COVID uncertainty, which is going to give coaches a little bit more rope and leeway. Right. Yeah, I, I'm not expecting them to get fired at the end of this year. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting year for sure. So we'll just have to see. Hopefully we can make some improvement. And uh, again, I guess we'll have to see what happens at the end of the year. So is there anything else you wanted to mention on Sheila Hamp? Or? No. All right. So we'll move on. And the last topic of the day, we just wanted to touch on the COVID-19 subject i know again it's kind of it's kind of coming back it's kind of becoming more relevant again there's been a lot of nfl players nba players it looks like um and the nba 16 out of the 302 nba players were tested positive i believe that was i think it was 5.3 percent of the entire league and obviously in the nfl i don't know the exact number but there has been quite a few notable stars obviously Ezekiel Elliott's tested positive recently. Von Miller tested positive about a month ago, two ago. Kareem Jackson from the Broncos is also tested positive. It's definitely coming back. And again, we're still not even sure if the NBA, this whole bubble, there's a lot of players talking about they're going to hold out and stuff. So as of right now, that's still planning on happening, but we're not 100% sure. We're going to have to wait and see. But again, this is just kind of putting, obviously, in jeopardy the NFL season. Also, the, they did cancel the Hall of Fame game. I'm not sure the exact date, but I know that was early August is when that was scheduled for, so that's already been canceled as well, which is just the first of probably many preseason games to be canceled, to be honest. So, again, um, I'm just kind of rambling. So, I guess, Jimmy, if you want to go ahead and give your thoughts kind of on how this might affect the NFL at all. Yeah, so your last point about the Hall of Fame being canceled, that was a pointless fifth preseason game for those teams anyway. I yeah. wish they'd 
wouldn't even play that game. It's, it's really meaningless. Nobody even plays in that game. Right. So, uh, as far as other preseason games possibly getting canceled, I think it's a good idea if they try not to cancel them. I know really? a lot of people are saying they're going to get canceled because they don't want to risk more positive tests. But if they want this season to go smoothly, I think you almost want to get those positive tests out of the way and get any kinks worked out before the regular season starts. So mm. the NFL thinking might be to try to play these games, work through things, figure things out before a, a sort of a test run for the regular season really starts and gets going. Because once the regular season starts, that is a consistent every week thing. And mm -hmm. it would be difficult to derail the season at that point. It, it would really screw things up. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as uh, the other, po the NBA, the 5% positive test rate, uh, I was really looking forward to this stat because you don't see this kind of statistic in the general population because you're not generally able to just randomly test groups of people to right. see how many are positive because of ethical issues and whatnot. So the 5% tracks very well with the positive rate across the country. So... Uh, that was interesting to see. Now, a lot of people have talked about the increased positive cases across the country. That's been a big trending topic, the mm -hmm. spike, so to say. Well, I, I just want people to understand that the increased positive cases by itself doesn't mean anything because it doesn't take into account how many people are getting tested. And it doesn't take into account the severity of symptoms of these positive tests. Mm -hmm. For example, in Washington State, where I am, the number of people being tested has about doubled since a month to two months ago. Yeah. However, the po percentage of positive tests still remains around 5%. And hospitalizations are also stable and not spiking. So, yes, the number of positive cases has increased, but that's probably due to just increased testing. So let's not get overly concerned about that just yet. That number by itself doesn't mean anything in isolation. You really have to look at the whole picture here. Yeah, that so. makes a lot of sense too. Like you said, just because testing has been ramped up and numbers are going up doesn't necessarily mean. And then I know, again, I know it doesn't really mean anything, but I know a lot of these people who have been testing positive have been either asymptomatic or very little to no symptoms as well. So that's another thing too take into effect like I believe um, Ezekiel Elliott said the same thing the worst he had was maybe a little cough and a little shortness of breath but it was nothing he thought was severe or anything like that so yeah so it was interesting what Ezekiel Elliott tweeted after he tweeted HIPAA <laughs> right after it was uh, released that he tested positive so he, he was a little surprised that it got uh, released and people f found out about it mm -hmm. but that's a good sign to realize that a lot of people are positive and you just don't know about it. A mm -hmm. lot of pl more players than we've heard about have tested positive. And because of the privacy issues, we just don't know about it. Exactly. So we're really only hearing about the people who somehow had a leak occur and somebody texted Adam Schefter about it. <laughs> yeah, so it's possible there could be almost a quarter to half the league who has tested positive. But like you said, because they're they're still at home, they're under quarantine or whatever as of right now, or possibly, I know they're kind of NFL teams are slowly opening back up, but they've, most of them have been under quarantine and stuff like that. So it's, yeah, it's difficult to say, like you said, if they've all been getting tested or if they're just even not, it's not getting out there that they've been tested or it's positive or anything like that. All right. So whether, what effect does this have on the upcoming season? It's really hard to say at this point. It's still, we still don't know so much about COVID and frankly infectious disease in general. So it's hard to know what these positive tests mean. Mm -hmm. Can you test positive more than once? I think definitely yes. So just because you test positive now, it doesn't necessarily mean you can't test positive later, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's anything serious right? either because you might have some immunity that prevents any further exposure of the virus to cause any severe symptoms mm -hmm. so it's really hard to say what to know about anything regarding COVID right now but the big takeaway is the country and the NFL does have to accept some risk as far as COVID we mm -hmm. have to accept that there are going to be positive tests 
we have to accept that there is going to be a small risk of somebody having health issues related to that. We're fortunate to this point that there's been no deaths or any severe issues with any active players. Mm-hmm. Uh, to me, that is really the nightmare scenario. If there was ever a active player that actually died, that I don't even know what would happen. That, that could just kill all sports mm-hmm. in uh, this country for an indefinite period of time. So hopefully, let's cross our fingers that nightmare scenario doesn't happen. And to this point, it hasn't happened, which is a right. really, really good sign that these young, healthy players can g- become positive for COVID but aren't going to have any severe symptoms. Yeah. That's another thing, too. Like, what about the coaches as well? Because we know, obviously, there's it's a little bit more susceptible to elderly people, and a majority of coaches are – some of them are pretty up there in age – So that could be another thing, too, what happens if a coach ends up getting it and possibly passing away due to complications from it. Or like we've I think we've talked about this on the show before. It's going to be real interesting if the season does go on as planned. But say a player or two players test positive of like a star player, like like say Tom Brady and Rob Gronkowski both test positive. So are they automatically out two weeks? And that uh, like right. that's going to be a complete game changer for and that's again that's not going to be isolated to one team that could be possible for any team and when you're playing when these teams are playing against each other it's possible for anyone to get it and be out for uh, any amount of time really yeah as far as how long a player would be out if they tested positive i don't think we know for sure right now if you look at the cdc criteria the return to work criteria it's no fever or respiratory symptoms and two consecutive negative tests 24 hours apart so technically potentially you could have a positive test on monday if you get a negative test on tuesday and wednesday and you're not having any symptoms or maybe you've never had any symptoms are you allowed to go back to playing thursday maybe that's that's possible so uh, there's so much we don't know about the protocols right now and things are going to change on a week-to-week basis Mm -hmm. and i know the nfl's been doing calls and they've been discussing and i think it's even been stated that they have a whole book of plans in place if certain stuff that were to happen or different fallback plans they have for the league so they're i think the nfl is definitely prepared they're prepared for players to test positive and they're prepared for any scenario really but again we're like you said it's just day by day we're gonna have to take it and see how it goes yeah Uh, the nfl announced some of their testing schedule they said they're planning on testing three times a week to me that Mm. suggests they're probably going to test monday wednesday and friday and try to avoid testing on saturday and sunday (laughs) they don't want to know about any positive tests on saturday or sunday because that's just going to throw a huge monkey wrench into the sunday game exactly that was sort of interesting and another topic was John Harbaugh and Sean McVay have said that it's going to be impossible to adhere to the protocols because of just how football is. Mm -hmm. And I I agree with them. It's not possible to play football without real close contact, heavy breathing, (laughs) spitting on each other, (laughs) and high exposure. So really, we have to accept some risk. That's Mm -hmm. the bottom line. And this country has to be able to accept some positive cases in the NFL and all major sports yep like i said it's just a day-by-day thing and we're just gonna have to wait and kind of see how it plays out yeah and it looks like the nba is still on schedule to start july 31st and i think mlb they were talking about starting july 24th correct me if i'm wrong so it's great to see that hopefully they'll get started and hopefully we'll they'll be able to play their season successfully, which will give us NFL fans really an optimistic view on how this season is going to go for us. Yeah, that's the biggest thing. If the NBA can finally, or MLB, I didn't even know they were about to get started, but if the NBA can hurry up and finally get started, and if that can go as planned, that can kind of give us some hope for the NFL season to go as planned. All right. Well, it looks like that's going to do it for us today. Uh, Thank everyone for tuning in, and we'll see you again next time.